Is it are we good? We are live and broadcasting audio right now, so we okay. should all keep that in mind. Okay. So so no person. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the other thing I have to check is whether it's broadcasting what screen is really broadcasting. Because oh yeah, Nian, this is this is fine. I'm checking whether it's currently broadcasting this screen to the live feed. So I have to look at that. I, I may also throw a wrench into the works. And I'm going to close this down and um, move a browser over to the other screen and show some stuff. So, and that's going to be here. I mean, it's just sort of quick demos. Yeah. Quick showing. We will. We're just gonna roll it. Whatever. I mean, that's the thing. That's the. That's the thing. You can always, for everyone who's listening to us talk right now. Yeah. Um, yes. If you give us the presentation afterwards, I can put a copy of the yes. slides up. Of course. Yeah, I'll give you a PDF version. I don't know how long it's been. Yeah, it's only for. Not very good. Battery working. The battery's working. On a slight delay, it's like someone else speaking. <laughs> When we did it last week, we ended up using the application window. Oh, it's not, I, okay. Oh, there we go. All right, let me know what it switches to now. It's this. Okay. And then we'll see how. Give it a few seconds. Are you okay with your speaking notes potentially showing on the Yeah, that's fine. It's not it's not cursy or anything. <laughs> It's because it switched the 
because you switched out, so it'll it'll cut the capture of however you had it before. I mean, the other thing that I'm more than happy to do is, you know, if you just want to stream audio, I will do you um, a narrated video when I get home. So at least you can see the slides and I do that all the time. I do that kind of stuff all the time. I'm more than happy. So now it's there, you can see what you're seeing. So, yeah. So the only way that I could do it without the notes on it is if we did it not in presenter mode, and then you would have to video. Well, okay. Yeah. Said, we'll do audio. Okay. Want me to cut the video then? I guess. Yeah. Well, you won't be able to see anything anyway, so it'll just be that. Right. I'll just, if I go back to. Because it is, and we'll, and we'll see the slides, and you'll have your thing, and you should theoretically be broadcasting just the black screen. If something else goes wrong, let me know. I won't be able to do anything. Right, I'll let you know regardless. Yeah. 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 I think we better uh, get started. Um, uh, as some of you know, we uh, live stream these uh, these yours uh, seminars, and we're having a for those. I know some people are online right now, uh, watching the live stream. For so for those who are uh, listening to the live stream, uh, we're having some issues with the <coughs> connection between the pictures and the audio. So. Those on the live stream, Ethan has kindly um, agreed that we'll be able to circulate the slides afterwards and perhaps even have a full yeah. um, a full video lecture uh, for you all. Um, otherwise, you should be able to listen listen in, if not. Just imagine me gesticulating wildly. Yeah. <laughs> and, so to, and, and if you have any questions, um, either in the room or on the live stream, you, we can communicate by a, um, Twitter or during the question period uh, using the hashtag yours, Y-O-H-R-S. <clears throat> and so with that said, I'm going to introduce uh, Ethan Wattrall, who's come all the way from Michigan State uh, University. We have a joke that every introduction now needs to start with Ethan the luminary in the digital archaeology <laughs> field. I think Gareth might have started this tradition. So, <laughs> um, we, uh, but it, it he is indeed um, uh, a real inspiration for those of us working uh, with digital um, communities and digital scholarship in archaeology and heritage. He's the director of the Cultural Heritage Informatics Initiative, um, an associate director of Matrix, the Center for Digital Humanities and Social Sciences at, the, at Michigan State University. And he's involved in a lot of um, affiliated projects, which he has. Yeah, there's swag on the table with people. <laughs> and I'm not taking it back. My, my. Um, uh, Colleen told me that I must say you that he's perhaps best known by his handle, Captain Primate, uh, on uh, Twitter. And he has, uh, she says, a little known history of being a jazz singer and martial artist. So um, anyways, thank you so much, uh, Ethan, for uh, joining and we look forward to hearing your thoughts on digital heritage and archaeology scholars and communities of practice. Well, thanks very much, Sarah, and thanks for everyone for filling the room. I really appreciate it. I was telling a couple of colleagues earlier today over, over Slack, some, some friends in sort of the DH uh, space, that was actually quite nervous about this talk. I mean, I we, you know, as scholars, we all talk on a fairly regular basis, and we sort of get used to it in conferences and stuff. But I, I was actually really quite nervous about this talk, because because this is sort of ground zero for all sort of wonderful things happening in sort of heritage broadly and, and digital heritage. So, you know, why am I coming to talk to you about it? You're already here. So, so that having been said, you know, I'll, I'll do I'll do my my little my my piece and and hopefully sort of contribute to kind of your my perspective on on this. 
Uh, so a little bit of background, and and you know Sarah talked a little bit about it. Um, so I'm at Michigan State University. I'm faculty in the Department of Anthropology. I am by trade and training an Egyptian archaeologist or an archaeologist of Egypt, uh, though work significantly in uh, North America as well, mostly on the northern uh, northern plains. Though I haven't stuck a trowel in the ground for very many many years, and it's quite likely that I that I won't, um, as as I've sort of taken on this kind of new persona and kind of new. Uh, uh, research. Um, uh, uh, I'm also um, associate director of Matrix, which is a research center at MSU and director of CHI, which I will actually be part of this uh, part of this talk. Now, um, um, uh, Michigan State University is actually kind of important. It, it, it informs uh, a lot of, or has informed, a lot of the ways in which I teach, and, and, and many of the things that are going to express themselves in, in this talk. Um, it is uh, um, a uh, one of the, the it is the first land grant institution in the United States. In in this room, that probably doesn't mean uh, too terribly uh, much. Uh, but land grant institutions were dedicated towards practical education, um, and uh, as such, uh, MSU has always been very very oriented towards doing and applying and practice. And that's really important as well. It's actually, in the grand scheme of things, it's actually older than York. I, I, York, I, I never get to say this when I talk in <laughs> Europe, where I say, MSU was founded in 1855. And when I have conversations with most European scholars, they're like, oh, my university was founded in the 12th century. <laughs> so, so it's actually kind of nice to come to a relatively younger university. So it's founded in, in 1855. The Michigan Agricultural uh, College actually was looking at this as the central part of campus. This is called the Sacred Circle. Um, it is the MSU is the is the largest contiguous campus in the United States. Um, it is uh, about um, 21 square kilometers all told. It's an enormous campus, um, and and more importantly than that, it is a campus that was originally thought of as very much a lab. It was conceived as a lab. The whole campus whether it was botany or zoology or ornithology or, or whatnot. So all of this is, it has very much informed a lot of the work that I've done. Um, MSU is also very much a, uh, a more, uh, it, it very much embraces its um, uh, public educational goals. Um, and it is, it is a bit of a blue collar university, lots of farm kids, which I absolutely love. And, and also really, um, embraces this idea of laboring in the public good. So, so we're going to see a little bit of that. That's that sort of informed my a lot of the work that I that I do. So, Matrix. I'm just sort of setting the stage here and giving kind of background. Uh, Matrix is my my research center, um, and in uh, in typical uh, uh, American style, uh, research centers are not degree granting, or we don't have our own PhD students. Um, it is a uh, we're we're geared towards externally funded research. Uh, we're one of the oldest digital humanities research centers in the United States. We're founded in 1995, so that makes us over 20 years old. We fall very much on the heritage uh, side of the DH equation, which is a very complicated equation. Um, and uh, a lot of our work, the vast majority of our work, is internationally oriented and specifically oriented towards Africa, South and Southern Africa and West Africa. I actually have a, pr a project right now in Senegal and a project in Mali. Um, and a lot of our, our work is uh, is that. So anyways, sorry. This is this is setting this this setting the stage and the various sort of units that have informed or played host for the stuff that I'm going to talk about. All right, so here is the 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 the, um, the sort of the problem, right? Digital is changing everything about heritage broadly defined, defined broadly construed research, publication, management, outreach, engagement. You know, it's the very nature of heritage is being transformed by all things digital. But here's the problem, right? Most heritage scholars or heritage practitioners are being challenged with uniquely digital questions for which they have no training. Now, of course, this, again, speaks to the fact that 
I'm talking to a room full of people who have that training or, you know, are in an environment that, that have it. But let's say, you know, generally speaking, uh, this was a bit of an unfair uh, picture. Um, this is Brandon Locke. Brandon Locke is the director of the Leader Lab, which is a digital pedagogy lab. This is Brian Geyer. He is a, 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 a graduate student in anthropology. That's Lacey over there. She's an undergraduate in history. They knew exactly what they were doing with this thing, but, you know, this is kind of setting the stage, right? So there is this, the, this, this challenge, you know, heritage practitioners, heritage scholars are being, being uh, faced with challenges for which they have no training, okay? So this is where this kind of intervention um, that uh, I'm going to talk about sort of comes into the picture. I want to talk about three projects. I want to talk about three initiatives at Michigan State University that I am, these are these are my babies, uh, as it were, though, though many people contribute and collaborate, um, that are designed specifically to intervene in this issue, right? You know, fill this gap, this need for students or existing professionals to basically get these skills and perspectives that are so critical to the way in which heritage is being practiced either in the academy or in heritage institutions or public archeology span or contract archeology span or whatnot. Uh, for which they have no training. So I'm gonna talk about the first two, the Cultural Heritage Informatics Grad Fellowship Program and the Digital Heritage Field School because they both fall under one umbrella, the Cultural Heritage Informatics Initiative. Now here's, here's the thing about this name. So this is, this. the initiative is six years old. It lives within the Department of Anthropology administratively but it's essentially an on paper kind of project. Um, that's because at MSU and lots of institutions in the, U in the US, it's really hard to create programs. Like the term program is an official administrative thing that you have to get approval all the way up the chain I can call anything an initiative, and it sounds really sort of formal, right? You know, but the university is like, okay, whatever. We don't, we don't care. So actually, a lot of what I do are called initiatives, um, <laughs> just because it's a sort of easy. Um, so we're in our sixth year. Um, I direct it. So lives in um, anthropology, um, and it is. It has two. It started out with two goals. Uh, first goal was to facilitate interdisciplinary scholarly collaboration in the institution. Um, MSU is enormous, thousands of faculty. It is a nation in and of itself, and it's often time hard uh, times hard to uh, even discover individuals who are doing similar work. So we wanted CHI to help facilitate that. And then the second thing is building digital capacity among, uh, among students. Um, CHI is, uh, always the, the sort of the most part of CHI is extracurricular. It is not curricular. It's very, very hard to implement curricular changes. The academy is a ship that is slow to turn. It isn't very nimble, um, consensus, it's complicated. So basically rolling uh, and creating um, extracurricular initiatives is a kind of a way to sidestep that. And that's what, um, that's what we uh, uh, tried to do with CHI, or I tried to do. All right, so it lives within anthropology. Matrix is a partner, um, and Matrix provides a lot of the, the technical infrastructure. One of the things that we'll talk about when we talk about graduate fellows is that we give server space and commit to sustaining projects in a longer term um, for the students, and all of that is provided by, uh, by Matrix. Um, I actually, for those of you who are interested in sort of logistical and financial stuff, um, I actually get my money, um, annual budget, from a whole variety of units on campus. Uh, graduate School in the College of Social Science, Department of History, Anthropology as well, Writing, Rhetoric, and American Cultures, and the College of Arts and Letters. And all of them have bought into this idea and have seen the value of the initiative and essentially have committed money annually for my budget together. And I have to go um, to all of these units with my handout every year. They're always very generous. 
Uh, but it's part of the challenge of funding something like this, which is kind of odd in the institution, is I have to sort of bring this, this money together. Um, the whole initiative is wrapped around or wrapped up in this word informatics. Um, now, informatics is, a, is kind of an interesting word, and we're seeing it in lots of places. So we're seeing community informatics, bioinformatics, uh, uh, music informatics, uh, chemical informatics. It, it is a, a word that has is is differently interpreted in different kinds of, of uh, communities. Um, the best definition that actually comes from Indiana University, where I did my graduate work, um, is quite simple. Basically, it's the creative application of information computing technology to X, to music, to anything, to cultural heritage, right? This idea that it's not about um, uh, this stuff, but it's about this stuff, right? It's not about the tools and technology, it's about the application of it to, to further um, the actual scholarly work in whatever kind of field it is, in this case, um, uh, cultural uh, heritage, right? So that's, that is the, the, the framework that I am using for this word. Um, informatics is also particularly sexy to the computer scientists or the genomicists. So if I say that word, they're like, yeah, yeah, I know what that is. And I'm like, okay, I don't have to explain it. Um, CHI deals with both tangible and intangible cultural heritage. Um, it is deeply interdisciplinary in the sense that it is a, um, it plays hosts for students um, from lots of different units on campus and departments on campus, as long as they are interested in heritage. As long as they're interested in cultural heritage, we're good. And as long as they can express that interest and knows, uh, know exactly what it means, I don't care whether they're built heritage, they're archeologists, they're museologists, they're classicists, they're philosophers, I do not care as long as they're interested in heritage. And which means we've got students working in both intangible and tangible stuff. Now, as the initiative evolved, the, the focus quickly shifted off of the facilitating inter interdisciplinary scholarly collaboration among faculty on the campus of MSU um, to basically um, a, a, a project that uh, capacitates students. So all of my work now, even though this is in the, uh, the uh, sort of the definition of CHI, all of my work is here, all of it, absolutely uh, all of it. Now, when we're looking at this, when it comes to CHI, there's two things I do. Um, so the first is the Cultural Heritage Informatics Graduate Fellowship, and the second is the Digital Heritage Fields. I will talk about uh, both of those, but let's talk about uh, grad fellows uh, first. All right, <clears throat> so there's a picture of my uh, that I recently took of some of my some of my fellows working. Um, they uh, I intake. It's an application process. Um, they apply in like April. Uh, the incoming cohort starts in the, the next uh, academic uh, uh, beginning of the next academic year, which is in September for us. Um, I depending on the funds I have, I will usually intake about ten fellows, um, and and that can sort of vary from year to year depending on. Um, the the applicants I get um, the 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 barrier for applying is actually quite low um, you know asking for a CV I ask him for a statement of purpose there is no technical experience required at all and it's actually something that they're quite they get quite worried about is I, I, I don't I don't have any technical skills I'm like do you understand the value of applying digital to heritage they're like yeah 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 and I'm like okay you're good um, I don't. I I don't have any expectation of technical skills. However, um, we have found that you know in the beginning, while uh, none of the students had technical skills, I'm getting more and more technical skills in the applicants, and that has more to do with kind of network effect um, and my efforts outside to recruit and capacitate students. So it's just sort of um, a kind of evolutionary process, as it as it were. Um, this uh, cohort, I have a sociocultural anthropologist, two archaeologists, a bioarchaeologist, um, a linguist, um, two people from two cultural rhetoricians, 
Um, one um, master student from the Department of Telecommunications, which is kind of odd, um, and then someone from English. I think that gets me to 10, right? So that's kind of a, sort of a variety there. The, oh, two historians, there we go. Um, so, so you can see that the core is oftentimes anthropology and history. I mean, that's kind of a logical um, uh, a, a group of students. And it's also, um, it's the, the students that I have the most connections with and sort of interaction with. But also we get a lot of other sort of variety there. And again, that core is cultural uh, heritage. All right, so what do we do? What do we do? What do the, what do the students do during the, the, during the fellowship? During the, and it's, a, it's an academic year. Uh, plus, so that is uh, nine months, um, two fall semester, spring semester, uh, then with an opportunity to extend during the summer, which most of them do. So essentially it's a 12 month fellowship and then I have a new cohort that comes in. So what do we do during that, uh, during that academic year? Well, the first is that the first half of the fellowship is, is a little more seminary where essentially I will lecture to them and I'm turning the fire hose on them. This is the capacitating part of it, where I talk to them about spatial visualization and JavaScript and frameworks and project management and you know all the things that I think they, uh, they need to know. Um, all of the platforms and tools that I teach is all open web stuff. I have a very, very strong, uh, strongly held belief in building for and on the open web. And that's actually gonna come back as I, I finish this. It's baked into everything that I do and everything that I teach. <clears throat> I also teach them how to use Git and GitHub and how to, you know, what is version control. And it's, it's and it's very, there's lots of software skills and there's lots of sort of development uh, development skills. So that's that's sort of the the, the more seminary, Ethan talking at them uh, portion of the uh, uh, portion of the, the fellowship. Um, so what did what are their responsibilities, right? There is an expectation I will teach them, but what do they? What is required of them? There's a variety of things. Um, the first is that they have to write publicly every month. So the CHI blog, which I'll actually show you in a second, um, is they're required every month, everyone has to do at least one post. Um, it could be about their project that they're working on. The idea is that they are uh, practicing scholarship in public. Um, and th there's an importance to that uh, which is beyond just allowing them to articulate their ideas. <laughs> it's also allowing them to form connections with the broader community, connections that they might not necessarily uh, have. Uh, one uh, of two of my fellows actually, based on some of their uh, blog posts, actually got invited to um, George Mason University, the Center for History and New Media, um, to actually talk about their project. And it was all based on what they had written. So it essentially exposes their work um, in the best possible way and in a way that they don't normally do. That'll, we'll talk about that in a, in a little bit. I'm actually gonna close this. I'm gonna show you, I'll open up um, the, uh, the blog right now. Oh, hold on. Uh, no. There we go, right? So you see, you know, and it's there, all the stuff like, so that's Erin. Erin's one of, uh, uh, she's actually interested in Norwegian national identity and heritage. She's a sociocultural anthropologist. And in talking about this, and this is Nikki Silva, she's an archeologist, right? So they're doing this on a, a regular basis and writing on a, a regular basis about the work that they're doing or in engagements or explorations of uh, certain kinds of uh, um, you know ideas or, or whatnot um, <clears throat> then they also do rapid development projects um, again this this idea I, you know I talk at them I teach them um, but I want them also to apply this stuff so what I'll do during the first half of the fellowship is you know based on what we're talking about spatial visualization data, JavaScript, you know, whatever. Um, I will then give them a challenge. I will say, all right, I want you to build X. 
Um, I want you to use X data. I group them up and then I just say go, go to it. And they essentially have a week, a week and a half to rapidly build a project based on my directions. Uh, and I'll, so I'll show you um, some of the, oopsies, I'll show you some of the, there we go. So here is so this is our this is our internal schedule, um, and you can you can see. Uh, let's move down. All right, uh, all right. So here's a here's one. I I I am personally, uh, I'm very interested in mapping. So I often have them do a lot of mapping stuff. Right. So here's the challenge: due October 30th. So that's that is basically a week from when it was assigned. Something called mapping memory. So choose non-US locations. Build a web page that displays a map of that. That you know, so all of this thing here. Put it on GitHub. Uh, have a brief description. Use a use a mapping framework, and that's all I say. I'm like, I don't care how you do it. I don't care what you choose. Just go, go do it. Go make it. Um, and there are then teams, right? You see here, there's teams of three there, and then they post their project and they have to present it, right? They gotta, they gotta show it to everybody in the, uh, the fellowship. And so the mapping memory one, there are a variety, Rome Through the Ages. This is my favorite, Ethan's Memorial Canada Land, um, where um, three, a, a couple of the, or the one of the teams created a, so I'm from Regina and Saskatchewan, um, basically created this fictional memory mapping of Ethan's childhood. I mean, they know nothing about me at all, right? Uh, and they they know nothing about you know what I did and how I you know grew up and stuff like that. So basically, they just you know here we go you know the old grain elevator you know Victoria Park. I mean, what they just did is they they picked out heritage spaces from my hometown and and created this right this narrative about Ethan's. I mean, the irony is that's actually kind of true. I lived very close to Victoria Park when I was growing uh, growing up. You know, so some of them are kind of cheeky, like uh, like this. Um, and this one was not so much. This was actually mapping labor in Wales. Uh, one of our fellows has a Welsh background, um, and she and her team sort of mapped uh, locations of labor history and labor heritage and this is done over a week that they did this and they they build these and it's rapid and it's intended to allow them to practice the kinds of skills collaboratively and design the project um, in, that we had been uh, we had been uh, uh, talking uh, about um, <clears throat> so that's the rapid development project. Peer tutorials, I actually asked them, I'm like, okay, look, there's only so much I could teach you in terms of time, in terms of just plain knowledge. So what I actually do is I turn it around and I say, all right, pick a tool, pick a platform, pick a whatever, anything you want, um, and teach everyone else. You know, and I'm pretty honest. I'm like, if you're teaching it, that means I don't have to teach it, which makes me particularly happy. But it also means that they're going to get exposure to a far broader array of tools and technologies. And it means the person who's teaching it, oh, they're all looking at that person, um, is going to delve much deeper into that thing. Because you want to teach a thing, you got to learn the thing a lot, uh, a lot better. So I have peer tutorials as well. But the big thing, that big um, sort of uh, uh, culminating activity is the final project. So all of the fellows <clears throat> are required to envision, design, develop, and launch a project, a real project by the end of the fellowship. And we actually usually, this process, while it, it's, it starts before the end of the fall semester, um, so a little bit before halfway through the, uh, the, the whole fellowship, usually they're only building and launching their project in the second half of the fellowship. So essentially, four and a half months, they're building this thing in four and a half months. And here's, here are my guidelines. Projects are public. Projects are real. Projects are technically challenging, and projects are scoped and attainable. So this isn't something that they're just going to demo and no one will ever see again. These are real projects that are launched that anyone can see, and they are public. Um, or 
and this will vary from, from project to project, it's publicness. There are some projects where some stuff can't be public, or it's not logical that it's public, and we'll actually talk about that in a little bit, but it has to have that strong public component. And I wanna very, very briefly just show you a couple of projects, if I can find them in my tabs. This is Mapping Morton Village. Uh, Mapping Morton Village is a digital cultural map of Morton Village, which is uh, a Mississippi and Anonio on a site in Southern Illinois. The director of the excavation is actually my chair, uh, Jody O'Gorman, and two of the uh, two of the graduate students, Autumn Byer and Nikki Silva, are, are that's their dissertation work there. So they built this digital cultural map of Morton um, with the intention of it being a public educational tool. Um, so glossaries and uh, you could actually, I don't know if this works, all right, you, you know, all of the various sort of layers there. There's actually a, uh, it's not loading in wonderfully. So you get the mag layer um, as uh, as well. Now, of course, this, uh, this was an interesting, um, project in the sense that this is really granular spatial stuff of an archaeology uh, of, a, of, a, of a site, which is something that makes a lot of archaeologists very nervous. You know, it's, sometimes it's a little bit of a red herring about sort of locating sites with granularity. My site will get looted if I put it on uh, online. And I mean, of course, it is a concern. However, this is on, this is a well-known site. Um, this is actually on Nature Conservancy land, so it's private land, um, which, and, you know, there are community members there, so it, so it allows for a little kind of more uh, protection uh, to it. And, and each of these, right, here's all the, the structures and the information on the, on the structures. Um, so, and they, they built this thing out um, in um, four and a half months. This is Talus, and this it looks weird because it's a mobile website. I've got it on full view. Talus was um, uh, created by Emily uh, uh, now Streetman. That's her married name. She's a forensic anthropologist, um, and it was a project to basically uh, bring together all of the aging and sexing uh, techniques that are oftentimes embedded in these really, really <laughs> big books. And a lot of forensic people have to bring these huge books into the field or into the lab when they only need like page 232. Um, and basically bringing all of these together into a mobile application that allows you to estimate ancestry, sex, age, stature. So it was, it was a tool for practitioners. Um, and we actually built a, a native Android app. Or Emily built a native Android app based on this. Um, this is the Armed Services Edition. It's a computational analysis. This was, this was done by an English PhD student. Um, during the Second World War, there was uh, a corpus of text, uh, or a corpus of, of books and, and um, uh, documents that were given to US servicemen overseas. Um, and she is doing computational analysis of this. So she scraped all the data out of Hathi Trust and did the sort of complex topic modeling. Um, and the website is not so much the result of the computational analysis, it's a methodological paper. So basically it's how did we do this? What were the results? So it is, it is sort of paradata a little bit um, as opposed to a website about the results of the, of the research. Um, okay, so that's a, a couple of uh, uh, examples um, of projects, many of them. There are a lot more, and you can find them on the CHI website. All right, so the fellowship is not without its challenge by any stretch of the imagination. I can't give nearly enough money to my fellows. I, I get, essentially what they get is $6,000 US. Um, uh, I give them two for each semester. I give them a grand in travel money. The idea is that, and travel money is actually fairly hard to come by for graduate students in the States. 
um, and I've given them this money to go out into the community and in their community, whatever it may be, um, and engage with other uh, scholars. And then I give them a grant for summer work as well. Um, it's not nearly enough money for them, and I can't occupy 100% of their time. So I have to be respectful of their other responsibilities um, and their other duties, whether they're teaching assistants or research assistants and whatnot. Um, it's oftentimes hard for them to balance the time commitment because it's extracurricular, it's not curricular. So I have found that some of them can't quite figure out how to, or have difficulty figuring out sort of time management, how this fits into their uh, lives. Also, in the past, I'm getting disapproval from advisors. I have had fellows who actually don't tell their advisor that they've got the fellowship because they're worried about the advisor saying, why are you wasting your time doing this? There is this, um, among some scholars, there is this opposition to this kind of work. This isn't your scholarly work. Why are you not doing your you know, medical anthropology work or whatever the, whatever the research is? So I have had sort of opposition and disapproval from advisors, which is problematic. You know, I, I talk with the fellows and I say, all right, do you, do you want me to intervene? Do you want me to talk to your advisor uh, about this and the benefits of this? Most of the time they've actually said no because they don't want to be put into that sticky situation. And of course, that's their business and I respect them. I'm not you know, gonna go out and make the intervention without their, uh, their approval. And then finally, it is way out of the comfort zone for some fellows. Um, it's interesting, you know, some of the some of the fellows really take to the technical work, and 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 it, those that take to the technical work uh, could have come into the fellowship with no experience. It's sort of a weird, um, unexpected, or kind of unknown variable. Who's going to really, really take to the work? But sometimes it's very much out of the comfort zone for some of them. All right, so that's CHI, that's the grad fellowship. Let's talk about the field school. Um, and of course, the Digital Heritage Field School, right? Uh, right, everyone knows, in this room, knows what a field school is. You know, oftentimes when I'm talking about this to, you know, people in English, I have to say, okay, this is what a field school is. It's the same model, right? Five weeks, um, back or uh, students come to MSU, Eight, five days a week, eight hours a day, uh, where we essentially teach them all sorts of skills. So landscape of digital heritage, and each field school is thematic. They focus on one specific theme, we'll talk about that in a bit. Project design, project management, promotion, engagement, sustainability, technical development, so whatever the theme we're doing, you know, the technical work will focus on that. Intellectual property, patrimony, licensing, right? All of these things that are critical in this space we will cover during the, uh, cover during the field school. Um, and what we do during the field school is very similar to what we do during the fellowship, right? You can, you can see a lot of these similar patterns. So lectures where, you know, I will teach them here I am lecturing about GitHub, um, and uh, you know I'll get more more generally and and you know lovely forking diagrams. Um, so you know sort of lectures um, and then small technical or conceptual projects in the same way that I do with the fellowship. It's applied, 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 applied. Um, where in this case, so this is a this is an interesting um, uh, experiment. What I did is I I turned them on the uh, University of Pennsylvania Museum of Anthropology and Archaeology's data. Uh, they've published all of their data, very clean collections data, very clean and under a very permissive CC license. So I basically said, all right, take this data and visualize it somehow. And that's all I said to them. And then they work for a day. This is, uh, so they actually visualized the, the intensity of collections um, in the South Pacific and where those collections came from. And it was just, I just said, go, do it. Um, here's another one where I said, all right, I want you to visualize uh, parks in the, the uh, US national parks. Um, and they built a timeline for it, right? So you'll have these kind of conceptual projects. And then I have large final projects. The students design, develop, and launch at the end of the field school. I do not tell them what to make. 
I barely even guide them on it. It is a discussion that they have. It is <clears throat> decisions that they have. Um, and they will say what they want to do, what's the scope of it, what's the message, what is it doing, right? Because that's the point. I mean, I could very easily say, okay, you guys are making this. But that cuts out that important process of conceptual design um, and you know building teams and building projects if I just sort of hand them a project. So um, they, uh, they, they conceive of it and they build it themselves. Now, I had said that they do sort of thematic. I, so I offer um, the field school, the, according to our, our catalog of classes, I offer the field school every other year. That sequence has broken down over since 2003 because I've had the Digital Archaeology Advanced Institute, which has been in the summer, that sort of impacted that. Um, so that's why we don't have any, any more than that. 2011, it was mobile and located. This is the theme. Uh, 2013, the theme was web uh, uh, visualization, visualizing time, space, and data. So let's see what they made, right, for each of these uh, the, the field schools. So mobile and locative, and, and if you have, uh, if you've had, you've heard me talk about uh, the field school, you know about these projects. Uh, so yeah, spoilers. Um, so uh, they built a, a mobile application called MS Museum which was designed for people to explore the archaeological heritage of the MSU campus. Um, and we collaborated with the Campus Archaeology Field School. This is Lynn Goldstein, the back turned to us. Uh, Lynn is the director of the Campus Archaeology Program. And her field school, the Campus Archaeology Field School, which is on the campus of MSU, was going right at the same time as my field school. So we collaborated together. Um, the students worked together, um, and they basically built this mobile application. Um, and you've seen this picture before, but but all of this stuff is, there is sort of buried archaeology. Most of the time, people haven't the faintest clue, visitors, alumni, whatever, don't have the faintest clue of what is below their feet. Um, and MS Museum was intended to do that. And its metaphor was campus as museum, thinking about the campus as a museum, right? Exhibits. Um, each of the exhibits had sort of uh, content. Each of the exhibits had locations. Uh, location info, this is for Saints Rest. Saints Rest is the first dorm on campus, which was burned down by a bunch of students with a uh, unauthorized stove in the basement, um, as undergraduates are wont to do. Um, and then we also had um, each uh, locations had this section called Dig Deeper. Uh, basically, not only about what we know, but how we know it. What was the archaeological process that uncovered um, Saints Rest, in this case, which was excavated in, in 2000, uh, 2005? Because, you know, archaeologists in the room know that the public is as interested in the process of archaeology as the product of archaeology. <laughs> that act of discovery is compelling and exciting. Uh, so giving people that content about that was important. And they built this. They built the whole thing top to bottom. You know, I coded and helped them and stuff like that. But this was all their baby. Uh, downloadable, free. It's iOS. And, you know, the irony of that is I'm an Android user. Um, but, you know, that's what it is. Um, and then everything is on GitHub, right? It's stored up on GitHub. All the source files are there for anyone to fiddle around with it as they as they see fit. Um, and MS Museum actually uh, led into my uh, new current project, which I'm not going to talk about, called Imbira, uh, which is actually a platform to build mobile heritage experiences that have that same space and place as museum metaphor. <clears throat> All right. Web visualization. This is a 2013 theme. Um, so essentially visualizing time, space, and data. The project that they built was called Detroit Digital. Um, it was an uh, attempt um, to a data-driven um, intervention in the public perception of Detroit as a crumbling city, as a city with no heritage, as a um, basically uh, um, a place that was only uh, suitable for, um, you know, ruin porn, 
right? You know, these photographers that go off and take pictures of crumbling Detroit. Nothing is further from the truth. So essentially, the students built this website about, you know, this data-driven exploration of Detroit's heritage with these themes, looking, listening, and speaking. And there's all sorts of visualizations built into it, and then sort of a narrative wrapping these visualizations. Um, this is a... Um, uh, a map of the historic and cultural landscape of Detroit. Let's see it. Uh, this is a visualization um, of attendance data for Detroit Tigers. Detroit Tigers are the, the, the professional baseball team in Detroit. And, and looking at this over time and how it spiked and how it moved and how it changed, um, here is a visualization about representations of Detroit in popular media and popular film. And this was all scraped from IMDb, and they cleaned the data and did all sorts of stuff. And the amount of tools that they used was just insane, right? It's like all everything from top to bottom, from sort of Google Docs to you know, X charts and timelines and QGIS. <coughs> and, you know, these are all the things that they engaged with, and they used to build these uh, visualizations. <clears throat> Challenges of the field school. It's expensive, um, oftentimes extremely so. Um, uh, it is large time commitment for students. It's difficult for international participants. MSU, it makes it really challenging. Um, it sets a very high bar for um, international students to come. It's, it's, it's doable, but it's just complicated, the administration and the logistic. And then it was also really difficult for non-student professionals, right? So imagine someone was working for a museum. Well, how can they take five weeks off? and then come and do this thing. So it's not without its challenges by any stretch of the imagination. All right, <clears throat> moving on to our last of these, the projects, the Institute uh, for, or on Digital Archaeological Method and Practice. This is the last piece of the puzzle. Um, this was a project that was funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities, and I have to give them a shout out for their generosity. Um, it was the Institute for Advanced Topics in the Digital Humanities, um, and the NEH has done so much for me personally, and so much for this space, um, and it's unfortunate, and I'm sort, of, I'm sort of pausing right now, it's unfortunate because it's one of the agencies which is under threat right now, and will most likely get zeroed out, and will cease to exist. Um, so recognizing the incredible work that the NEH has done, both personally and sort of more broadly professionally, is important. Uh, Co-PI for the projects, Lynn Goldstein, so this is Lynn, um, Director, Professor of Anthropology, Director of Campus Archaeology, and Mortuary Archaeologist. Um, here is the cohort. So essentially, it's a two-year grant um, where the idea is that we wanted to bring archaeologists, graduate students, uh, we couldn't fund undergraduates. The, uh, the, the, the grant doesn't fund undergraduates. Museum archaeologists, contract archaeologists, academic archaeologists, and closely affiliated scholars. Bring them together for one week in one year, another week in another year, and then build a project in between. Again, still very applied. This is my cohort here. We got uh, 200 applicants. Um, I was only able to choose 30 of them, um, and it's quite a variety from department chairs, associate deans, uh, graduate students, postdocs, contract archaeologists, um, quite a sort of spectrum of individuals. Some of these people are actually faculty that are, that are in there. Um, so what did we do? Um, lectures, introductory, inspirational, aspirational, workshops, right? This is very similar to the kinds of things that we've already talked about. Rapid development challenges, playtime, and then projects. Um, and uh, sort of the instructional component of it was quite varied. So here's uh, Catherine Foley, who is the, the director of digital library and archive projects. She's a, a digital librarian uh, for Matrix, talking about metadata. I mean, wildly exciting topic. Um, Sean Graham talking about topic modeling. Dan Pett talking about, I don't know what the heck Dan was talking about at this time. Um, there's lots of stuff. Uh, uh, Kathleen Fitzpatrick, who is the Director of Scholarly Communications for the uh, the MLA, one of the sort of luminaries. Hey, look, I used that word. <laughs> Kathleen is a luminary. 
um, in open access and scholarly publishing, so not in archaeologists at all. Eric Hansa talking about sort of data and data publishing, um, and Brian Geyer, Brian's actually a graduate student talking about digital mapping. Um, and here's the faculty, right? And so we've got quite a mix of people from inside and outside North American archaeology, and that was the point, was to bring some of these things that people might not necessarily, uh, um, or, or bring things from other disciplines and other fields into this, um, uh, this situation. Um, most of it was this though. There, there was not a lot in the way of lecturing, but it was discussion. It was small group discussion. It was experimentation. It was consultation and it was crazy fun too. This is Michelle Coons. Michelle is a, a curator of archaeology at Denver, Denver Museum of uh, uh, Natural Sciences. And the culmination was the final project, right? I, you know, it's just very repetitive, but it sort of speaks to this model a little bit that I'm going to talk about. Um, individually conceived and built, uh, or they could be collaboration with non-institute people, or they could be collaboration between institute people. Um, scoped and attainable public aspect, encouraged to share code, where possible tools are open. You know, this is what I told them. This is your challenge when you do your final projects. Um, I could show you a couple of projects, but I know time is an issue. Um, now, and in this regard, the Institute um, is both about investing in people, right? Building people. That sounds very science fiction. -y. But it's not meant to be. Um, right, capacitating, building scholars, um, investing in their professional growth and success, but also building evangelists, people who will go out into the community and evangelize, you know, not for the institute, but the things that they learned at the institute. It's also about building communities of practice, right? People who share values in this space and share approaches in this space. One of the ways that we tr uh, built and tried to sustain community, and still the jury is out whether this is going to be a success, is the Digital Archaeological Commons, uh, which is a hub for community building um, in digital archaeology and digital heritage. I really strongly encourage you to check um, it out. Which leads to our punchline of the talk, an unexpected model. Um, and I'm putting model in quotes because my approach or our approach to teaching digital heritage and digital archaeology evolved from practice and experimentation. It wasn't like I started out to develop a model, just sort of evolved into one. And it's even barely a model. Um, it might be more appropriate to say uh, the Wattrell way of vaguely doing things. Um, but there is, you know, there, there across CHI, across Digital Heritage Field School, there are these, these common approaches um, that um, have become very important um, and something that is potentially applicable to other places. All right, so what's the first of these is an ethos of openness baked into both CHI fellowships in the field school, um, as well as the institute, strong ethos of openness. And when I talk about openness, I'm talking about it across uh, uh, six axes. Open access, open methods, open code, open data, open tools, open web. Um, and all of these are critically important. Openness can express itself in lots of different places in lots of different ways. Uh, so this is a recognition that openness is not just open access or open data. It's also open methods and open science and open communication um, and building on and for the open web. This is my metaphor for the, uh, for the open uh, web. <clears throat> This also means that you need to openly expose your scholarly process and your methods. The idea, the idea of iterating openly is baked into the very nature of CHI and the Institute, releasing code, writing about the process, writing about the outcome. Now, sometimes this is really hard for scholars. Uh, sometimes it's very, very hard for scholars, downright terrifying, right? Um, it's hard because it requires a realignment of our scholarly practice. We as, you know, the academy, generally speaking, encourages people to polish our work until it's a shining gem and then only release it. 
everyone remembers what our friend Voltaire says is the perfect is the enemy of the good. You know, if you try to make something perfect, um, it's quite possible it will never see the light of day. And we have this mantra at Matrix of, is this good enough? Is this thing good enough? If it's good enough, kick it out the door. And we'll get, you know, as opposed to, is this thing perfect? Because it's never going to be perfect. Now, part of the process of exposing your web and iterating, or exposing your work and iterating openly means you do so online. Put your stuff on the World Wide Web. Um, because here's the thing, disciplines are like a small, tiny, millions of little islands, also all isolated from one another. We don't go to the same conferences, don't publish in the same journals, uh, we barely even cross paths. But if you expose your work and put your work on the web, which is a giant discovery engine, um, there are uh, uh, greatly in increased opportunities for interdisciplinary dialogue and collaboration. Notice how I made anthropology the largest, largest island. I'm an anthropologist. <laughs> <coughs> Screw art history down here. <laughs> but sorry to any art historians. Or, <laughs> or apparently philosophy. I don't know why linguistics looks like a fish. Um, now, the discussion of openness, you know, in, in any kind of a way, is oftentimes characterized as this, right? It's characterized as old versus new, new scholars versus old scholars. This is a red herring. This idea that openness is new and openness is innovative. Some of the most open scholars in uh, this discipline that I know of are super old school, um, and they've embraced this. So, so don't don't let um, uh, the idea of openness become binary uh, in the sense of, you know, old versus, uh, versus new. And, and beyond that, I should, probably shouldn't use the word, the word binary, um, openness as a practice isn't necessarily uh, binary. Um, there, there are not two states to openness, open, closed. Sometimes the dialogue about openness, whether it's code or data or access or whatever, oftentimes breaks down along this, right? You're either open or you are closed. Openness exists along a spectrum, um, and it is informed by your unique situation. Um, sometimes closed is not always bad. And this is coming from a very staunch advocate of openness. This is not necessarily bad. However, let's be clear about one thing. The default state of digital heritage should be open and then you negotiate or you work downwards if you need to sort of towards close based on your kind of local setting finally and this is important you need to be evangelists for openness evangelize for thoughtful approach to openness so so this is all so this ethos of openness is baked into all of this stuff preaching about html5 from the from the pulpit um all right the sort of the last part of the, the model itself beyond an ethos of openness is applied. Building and making. You've already noticed that every, like a broken record, I've said rapid development projects, final projects, build stuff, launch stuff. Everything I do, everything I teach is about building things. It's about experimentation. It's about releasing real things. And in that, I have to expect my students, or I expect my students, to embrace some concepts. Be flexible. Figure it out. Break stuff. Hack. Fix. And don't have fear. One of the things that I find and I have found over the years about teaching students this stuff is they're oftentimes terrified. Uh, am I going to break the internet? No, you're not going to break the internet. It'll be fine. <laughs> Just make a backup and you'll fix it. So this is actually, of, of all that I do and all that I impart upon students, this don't have fear about doing this stuff, experiment. And this missive also requires a strong culture of sharing, culture in which people are social, they teach one another, generous with their expertise, their experience, their code, their data, their tools, and their time. Culture of sharing. And with that, I want to leave you this picture of a grain silo because I'm a kid from Saskatchewan and I, you know, this is what I grew up against. But a silo is a good metaphor, right? This, this 
this uh, idea of openness, this idea of hacking and breaking and sharing has to exist in a place where there are no silos, intellectual silos, professional silos, silo system, because disciplinary, intellectual, technical practice does not function in a siloed system at all. And with that, I will be done. <laughs>
in contrast, my dad is actually a director of informatics. Oh, really? That's weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, carrying on from that, um, you didn't use the word sustainability much. This might have just been <laughs> I, I actually did. In one of in one of those bullet points, <laughs> I said sustainability. So, yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm curious, this is a general point as well about reception studies. Yeah. I know this wasn't necessarily the, the goal for your, for your fellows, for yeah. your students. How many people have interacted with these databases five, ten years down the line? And if so, what have they used them for? Do you have any statistics? Um, Yes, on a project by project basis. So, 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 sort of step away from this stuff, the pedagogical stuff, and the actual sort of research and the work that that I've done. Whether it's the the slave biographies database or the quilt index, or you know all the sort of projects that I've that I've been on that have um, a, a longer lifespan. Um, you know, we have done. And the the thing that's important is there's in all of those cases there is no um, uh, answer uh, to that question that exists across all of those projects, right? It's different from project to project. Um, so say for instance, um, the, the Quilt Index, which is a, a giant uh, digital library that we run with like 250,000 quilts from around the, around the world. Um, I've told people this before, I have a love-hate relationship with, with quilts, but it's a, but it's a large um, um, uh, database, or it's a large digital library. And through um, user studies and, and you know, uh, user research, we, we found that use is most intense, and this is just a case study, Use is most intense in the lay quilter community. There's a really strong um, sort of uh, a community of lay scholars within the quilting community, and they're using this as scholarly resource for their work. So, so I guess the, the punchline is that it depends from project to project. User studies um, are, are absolutely necessary. And the, the question and the challenge of sustainability is actually probably the most uh, pressing challenge of this work. Both, uh, I built it, are people going to use this thing? And how are they using this thing? And is it a value, right? It's really hard to quantify value. But also, how do you sustain this thing over the long term? Um, a, a challenge that I know that, that you guys have here that, that I have is a grant is not for sustainability. You don't get money to, to, to sustain a project um, you know, for 10 or 15 years. You get money to build a project. How do you sustain that thing? Very, very challenging. I don't know if that answers the, the question, but it, it talks at it. I have been wondering something similar though, because when you showed the digital, uh, the Detroit digital mm -hmm. project, if you plopped all that text on there into a readability meter, oh God, please sure don't. It, would be, it would be really high. So then I was also thinking about audiences because yeah. that wouldn't be accessible to no. a variety of different audiences. No. And hence, I was also wondering yeah. how much audience figured into the into, in the process. Y you are absolutely Sorry to pick on that particular no. You are project. absolutely you are absolutely right, <laughs> yeah. and and especially. Uh, accessibility for the sighted uh, or non-sighted and cognitively yeah. impaired certainly is is something that we're only starting to see become uh, a fabric in a lot of these projects as a as a first sort of order goal. There's a question. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much for today. I think the emails from this talk have been great. Thank you for some Oh well, you're very welcome. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. What I'd like to focus on is both the public and the community. Mm -hmm. Our background is in the question altogether, which has a very broad definition of usual practice, mm -hmm. including volunteers, paraprofessionals, professionals. Mm -hmm. And our comes up in the world of archaeology mm -hmm. uh, in the North England. Um, it's very apparent. But the bit of the community that gets missed out on all this, I know your book is very big, yeah. and probably the audience here, the bit that gets left out is the majority of people who engage with archaeology in North England who are volunteers, yep. some highly qualified yep. and some very skilled and tremendous practical skills. Yep. But I'm 
I'm working in areas where there's a little spectrum of area here. Very evident resources, universities, private businesses. What reasons so policy is that most of the national situations are not invested in their resource, people, or material in capacity building mm -hmm. from that huge mass of people on which archaeology is the most effective to work. Mm -hmm. And I would like to ask you how do we go about doing that? Take the public from debating the public to how do you build that community of practice from those volunteers to set up a crowd? I think that, I mean, you're absolutely right. And, and it's so, I mean, I grew up in, in Canada, there's a, there's a whole community of uh, uh, what are called avocational archaeologists who are non-professional archaeologists that are actually very much part of the fabric of archaeological practice. Um, and, you know, oftentimes in a lot of this professionalization, they are ignored. Uh, or they are are neglected, and 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 while it's it, it's certainly a, a complicated, or potentially complicated um, uh, 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 situation, I think that you professionalize when it comes to digital stuff, right? Because that's what we're talking about. You professionalize those individuals in the same way that you professionalize them with traditional archaeological methods. So they, you know, will go to field schools or they'll have, you know, volunteer opportunities. Why? There's no reason at all that you couldn't inject digital methods into the venues that they are getting training and experience for traditional archaeological methods. No reason at all. Um, I mean, they're learning to use transits or theodolites. Why not teach them how to use structure for motion or stereophotogrammetry? You know, it, it, it would slot sort of very nicely into that model. And, and more importantly, you know, while these people are not professional archaeologists, this is not their job, those kinds of technical skills actually might give them a benefit in their regular lives, whatever they, whatever they may be doing. So there might be an added benefit to that as well. But I would just say, you know, put it alongside of regular teaching and regular archaeological methods. To comment on it from the British perspective, the uh, Heritage Lottery Fund has a program uh, called Skills for the Future, which is meant to do partly what you're talking about in some ways, but it's a, it's a narrow program in some ways and, and is being developed in different directions, perhaps not with digital at its, at its core, but it has a philosophy, I think, that's meant to get at um, what you're broaching there. Having said that, there's lots of opportunity mm -hmm. for yeah. more to happen. And it's yeah. something that we've talked about with different museums and other mm -hmm. cultural institutions, because there's loads of opportunities to use collections, not mm -hmm. as necessarily means to even teach about heritage, but actually to build other types of skills, yeah. like how to program a website. Yeah. Or you use the collections of the museum as a means to do that teaching. Yep. Yeah. Um, thanks for all that. It's really helpful. And I recognize some of this going on. But, it's a big buzz. I know about the country of culture too. I'm not sure that the academic community of practice and its immediate associates is what's going on out there. I'm part of the project of the Rider Landscapes in the Middle East. We work in Sharp and Sedgeford in Norfolk in the five years. I'm involved in the project of the Now, they don't happen because we need to be taught skills. We have transferable skills that can be used by hundreds of us. I really would like to start constantly and criticize this. Look, come on, folks, get yourselves placements with views and groups and just find out what's there in terms of skills, knowledge, and experience, mm -hmm. and exactly what people are generating out of them. At the moment, all the respects of the universities are really close. Thank you. No, I mean, you're absolutely right. It is. I mean, there's always been this impermeability between the public and academic institutions. And I, and I actually think that um, of all or of many um, disciplines within the academy, archaeology is probably the best at engaging with the public. You know, it's still very problematic, but sort of recognizing that is um, is important. But, you know, you, you are right. Absolutely. I don't agree at all. No? <laughs> and I think that by lumping them all together as though every university is doing the same thing is quite doing real injustice to programs that are actively. And for instance, the Center for Digital Heritage, and Gareth is here and can speak about it perhaps at the pub later, uh, if he's around, has been doing exactly the kind of thing that you're talking about. And so 
I think it's a bit unfair to turn it all into one giant. The universities and scholarly community don't know anything. I think there's a huge number of exceptions. If you just look through, as I've done, what the academics put on that page is students who have science about their particular interests, both place and subject. Um, I've got more fun, chances of finding somebody actively engaged with public community archaeology, digital archaeology. Uh, finding somebody who's involved in the archaeology channel. There's, there's, there's a transition that needs to go on here, which needs to build on what's been done well, and spread it wider. Community archaeology is the first thing in my bio. Shane, had a point, so. Well, yeah, Don Henson, who was here earlier, and left, set up a community activism course. You're at UOT, you're better than most. Uh, I'm sure it is, but folks, you know, you're all public universities, and it's an issue you're all sorting out. Anyways, uh, did you have a question, Megan? Yeah, um, so I'm interested because you're you're working with fellows who come in who may not have a lot of digital experience. Mm -hmm. What do you do to give them a grounding in <clears throat> digital ethics when they're suddenly using all these tools that they may not have any sort of background in? I mean, it's, it's baked into a lot of the discussion. I mean, they're all coming into the with their disciplinary ethics, right? And it's e it's quite easy to bridge that, you know, that sort of disciplinary ethics and how does how does that connect to potentially sort of application or sort of ethical applications within a, within a digital environment. But it's also something that we sort of talk about on sort of a day-to-day -day basis. You know, the example is, you know, digital repatriation and patrimony and all that kind of stuff and the, the complexities of that. And that is, right, uh, the, the ethical facets of sort of building digital archives or, or something like that. So so it's it's absolutely woven into the fabric of all of our so all of our discussion. It's not a specific yeah. Side yeah, no, it is it is purposefully day to day and yeah. purposefully and, and I actually think that that is I I, I that is a better strategy because you have to contextualize it, right? As opposed to sort of separating that out into a siloed discussion, it has to be contextual, right? Here are the ethical ramifications and issues and problems and challenges, let's talk about it, within the context of X. Um, so that is absolutely baked into almost everything that we talk about. Thank you. I had um, two, I, I want to interject so I can ask my yeah. two questions. Yeah. <laughs> um, one is, I was really struck by the picture of your cohort of fellows mm -hmm. because it relates to something that Holly and Colleen mm -hmm. and a few others of us have talked about a lot, which is the number of women yeah. um, that are enrolled on that program. Yeah. And then separately, you had the next photo, which was the teaching staff, which was majority men, yeah. Let's hold majority on. female uh, students. Uh, <laughs> I counted uh, uh, more. Uh, 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 <laughs> it, it, was, it was one over half. I think. Okay, okay. So one, two, three, four. Uh, all right, it's a little more. <laughs> one, two, three. So, so six to three. we have been having this conversation about whether there is yeah. a shift happening and, and in, eventually in the future, perhaps that like photo of the teachers will be majority women. Yeah. But archaeology has a history, even if you go back into the 1930s, of having more females, sometimes up to 90% of females on the earliest archaeology courses. Mm -hmm. And I wonder where you think this all fits. But it relates to my okay. uh, second question, yes. which is, or point, I don't know, comment, is that you? one of the things that we've found, and that I've experienced personally, so it's on my mind a lot, is that uh, we also have tried to kind of encourage this have no fear mm -hmm. and also have no silos model. Yeah. But maybe you can see where I'm going with this. The more that you break down, you the, you know, the more that you break down the boundaries, the yeah. more that you're going to be subject to harassment and other forms of behavior that mm -hmm. mean that you should have some fear, <laughs> yeah. um, or at least so, you need to have some kind of tools in place to help when things go wrong. And I wondered, can you talk briefly about what you provide to keep people safe? So, so yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. The, the, that missive, no fear, it, it did. It didn't mean. It doesn't mean. Uh, don't be afraid of exposing yourself online. It. it that sounds really bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, but y'all know what I mean, right? Okay. 
um, that has don't don't be afraid about breaking stuff. You know, that, I mean that's but that's so, so, but, technology right. oriented. But that having been said, I mean that's a that is an Im, important uh, important point. So one of the one of the things that and it's and it's it's not one of the things that a question that we engage with is the status of this work and the status of this approach to work within the current norms and values of the discipline, right? And, and how graduate students who at, at this stage are a very vulnerable population it, for a, a lot of reasons, um, how you can negotiate this and, uh, you know, recognizing that um, you may choose not to be open, for instance, because of, you know, um, very specific kind of professional reasons. You don't you don't want to go head to head with you know powerful scholars within your discipline that can destroy your your career. Mm -hmm. So we're we're engaging with this these these questions and 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 negotiating that where they sit along that spectrum, right? And also as director of the program uh, I have to be respectful of that and and not only sort of respectful in a very sort of you know patrimony sort of way but it's like the, you make the decision that is best for you based on your specialized knowledge in your field which I do not have at all and 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 are and understand that your work within the the fellowship is shaped by those that knowledge does that does that make sense? Okay. Um, <laughs> got it. Yes. I, gender. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, let's go. I want to go back to go back to faculty. This was actually not my original choice of, of uh, faculty. My the original choice of faculty, uh, oddly enough, was was balanced much more in the the other direction. Um, and that's not to say that um, these people were second, third, fourth choices because they weren't. Uh, but it just sort of the the faculty sort of worked out that uh, that way. Um, the uh, the the students themselves this this was shaped purposefully um, we we made so we had 200 applicants the most of the applicants uh, were were women um, uh, but we specifically chose to have a strong sort of balance in in this this direction um, so this this composition was a, a little bit purposeful um, about how many how many women we had in the. In yeah, the, in the it group. wasn't really an accusatory no, I know. statement. No, no, I know it, it isn't. Like I know it is something isn't. To, for us to be thinking about because we've talked yeah. about it a lot, and I'm not entirely convinced that the structures are in place to yeah. actually facilitate those same women becoming. Yeah, no. You know the the key professionals in the field in yeah. the future. So. No, and I know, and I know it wasn't accusatory, yeah. Yeah. and it, it is something to. <laughs> something to be very mindful of and thoughtful about um, and also thinking um, longitudinally yeah. as opposed to just in this instance in this um, in this uh, moment and and interestingly enough one of the things that we one of the sort of the questions that we engage with with the CHI fellows is the this fact of sort of breaking and hacking and right this 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 sort of technical challenge very much differs between people of color and people and and um, uh, you know uh, 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 non people of color it's it's different the because and and the way and this expectation that we might have to say well just go do it right is it expresses itself differently in different sort of ethnic communities and we have to be sort of recognize uh, that it's something we talk about a lot so Thank you so much, Ethan. And we'll, we'll carry on the conversation at the pub. We'll go to Eagle on Child, uh, just around the corner, if you want to uh, join us. Uh, otherwise, make sure you pick up some snazzy uh, gifts from Please, please uh, pick Ethan. it all up. And so many thanks to you, Ethan, for a very interesting uh, talk. <laughs> Thank you
Let me close this out.